I wanted to discuss the roads and traffics, both the internal private roads and the Kyogo Road public road and the bridges. But first I wanted to actually tell people the program that I'm actually using to display on this. As luck would actually have it, I had been trying to set up their concept onto Google Earth Pro and I had just completed putting in all the roads and the initial housing and everything and got a concept of what they actually wanted to achieve when they put out their, um, well, when it became public knowledge that the development application had been lodged. So then I then had the benefit of all these actual documents to then go in and create overlays out of. Now, the program itself is a free program that anybody can use on their desktop. I'm not so sure how workable it is on other devices, but I know it does work on a desktop. And the simple thing is that the easy thing for me to actually share everything that I've got here so that you can get all of this so that you can interact with the information as as I do is I right click on here save places as I save it as a file name and I send someone a link after I've downloaded or uploaded it to Google Drive it's that easy to share this information and I would prefer to share it than other people um, spend the days because I have to tell you that it did take me days. There's a lot. There's 392 houses. There's at least, well, all the coloured roads are 26 and a half kilometres, but then there's all the other roads that they haven't included. And there's a vast amount of information. So I had this basic store of information then the, the DA came out and they provided a lot more photographs of what I also had as well. And it also enabled me to actually identify, identify a lot of the structures already on the property and in what condition they were in. These were all things previously that like, no matter how much people tried asking questions, it was like, well, you know, come along and ask. We're not going to tell you. It's like the, anything that goes on with this development is the biggest secret under the sun. Nobody can know unless you show up and it's told in the certain, you know, tour groups and the secret meeting stuff. Now the good thing about using Google Earth 2 is that it is all scaled to, um, well, I suppose you could say Earth geometrical standards. So essentially when you go up here and you do one add polygon and you go around and you measure up these areas, all these areas I'll just show you. Now this is a little box you bring up the properties by right clicking it's very easy on any of these things and it brings up all these tabs now the measurements tabs is the one I find interesting because here you can set it to any parameters that you want so do I want to know how many square acres square meters square whatever so maybe in this circumstance we'll go with square acres because that's actually what I was doing, was de defining the size of the 2.47 acres of exclusive use area that is allotted to each person. So you can actually go through and measure it. Now, each one of these ones that is that I've shown as green is actually 2.47 acres. Again, I was very meticulous in trying to make it as accurate as possible. Now one thing you do realize when you are working on a scale like this that the positions of the road you can see where the road goes but it's marked to be somewhere differently and if you move it to where they say it is it can mean you know an extra kilometer on the road or it could take off a kilometer. 
So when it comes to things like this, it's a fine measurement. And within all of the road measurements of what I've done, each one of these roads, you can likewise get the measurements on. Where are the roads? Can't see, there we go. They're categorized into unsealed, ones with sealed patches, and the three bridges. And each one of these road lengths has been identified to which road that they attach it to. So it's road 1 through to 21 that they're actually looking at upgrading and have done plans for. And I've colour coded them because when I had already created this, I had colour coded them for easy identification so I could look at one area and say, right, the yellow area because at that stage I really did not have a lot to reference it with but that's a little bit different now. Since the lodgement of the DA there has been a lot that has been able to be determined. Now many of the things over here will bring up information. Some of them will actually bring up pictures but they will bring up information if they're highlighted like this. They are a linked information. Now as you can see here, we'll get into the road shall we since we're on that page. So from the images provided in the DA, they give two clear visuals of their unsealed roads. One is clearly an unsealed road and the other is, well, that's actually not a road, that's just sort of like a track, you know, so that has actually got to be turned into a road, so all that topsoil has actually got to be removed, all these trees six metres wide, and then you've got your setback from there too as well for your drainage, I suppose, and everything. Or does that include the six metres? I'm not quite sure on that. I'd have to check on that. But anyway, so areas like this may not be part of these roads around here. But some of them, it doesn't even look like they do have a road in there. So they're going to have to construct one. Like, um, some don't even have roads marked in. Like this one here doesn't have a road marked in. So ultimately, if there is a road, it might look like that or it might even look even more rugged. You just don't know. So the classification of their roads within the private structure, the 25 and a half or 26 and a half kilometers of unsealed roads that they intend to upgrade. There are a couple, couple of safety issues that come to mind with those dirt roads and hundreds of community members using those dirt roads every day. Now they also go on to show, see that to me, that's not a road, you're going to get up there in a four wheel drive or walk it. You know, um, that's going to do damage to your car, an ordinary car, if you try taking it up there. So, you know, that's not a road, that's a track. You know, a track that is wide enough that you might be able to get a car up there. That's overgrown and unused. So clearly, you know, it's a big comparison to these. And again, if these are roads that they intend, all these trees along here are going to have to go. There are 26 and a half kilometers. They already state that they are two kilometers, uh, two meters wide, and that they need to be six meters wide. So all roads, at the very minimum, need to be widened by twice as much again. So these roads, twice as much again. This is two meters wide it needs to be six meters wide. And that is a lot coming off either side of those roads. There goes all those big trees there that are actually helping to stabilize the road. 
I can't really see from the images there, but you actually might then be getting into younger growth that actually will be more subject to erosion than the bigger trees are. Now there is a proposed speed limit on all these unsealed roads. It's 50 kilometres per hour. And it's the 50 kilometres per hour that I actually have concern with. Because already before they've put in this development application, Mark McMurtry that lives over here loves gunning his hot rods up his driveway to annoy his neighbours. He is a rev head. Okay, these kinds of roads, 50k is cruising speed to start with. You know, you get to a straight, she's up as far as it'll go before you come into a corner and you've got to knock it all back those gears and, you know, control swinging it round. And that might be all well and good on these roads when nobody else is using them. But once you get 392 dwellings in there and perhaps a thousand cars on the road every day through these areas, these unsealed roads are not going to be safe enough for all the traffic that's going to use them. They may widen them and make the roads wider, but you are still going to have people that are going to speed along these straight roads. They're going to come to an area like this and they're going to spin out and someone's going to hit a tree or something like that. And this is where you might encounter another problem. And this is where I tried... Hmm, it's out there somewhere and I will find it. There's a video of Mark McMurtry appearing in court. He was driving without a license on public roads. And his claim was that he was a tribal man and he was using tribal... Um, he was travelling on tribal land with the permission of the tribal owners and he didn't need their consent. He, um, the, the government's consent to drive on the uh, tribal lands, even though it's their public roads. And the thing was that he actually won that case. That's actually one of his very rare wins. And I don't know how he actually won it. Maybe, I don't know. But anyway, so I wanted to show people that there was this predisposition with Mark McMurtry, one of the main developers and his political views, that there is not a necessity to have a valid driver's license or even to register your vehicle. Because these are all things that the Crown re requires and as tribal people they don't have to do that. So imagine on these private roads there is a car accident. There is not going to be any insurance. Well, unless you pay extra for travelling, if you tell your insurance provider that you live in this area and it's got all unsealed roads, they will put a hefty lev levy on it if they will actually give you insurance. Because generally speaking, uh, most insurances just cover sealed roads. So insurances in these circumstances would be iffy. But in the scenario that even third party compulsory insurances through registrations would not come into play if so many of these people are falling in line with the cult mentality of Mark McMurtry and don't have valid driver's licenses or valid registr registered vehicles. So you might think, well, you know, that's just a problem for them in the community to deal with. But that's actually not just a problem that they will have to deal with internally in the community. It is something where they will take those unregistered vehicles 
and their lack of licensed driving go out the gates over the bridge and onto the main roads. And if they are pulled up, they have this prepared speech of where they are travelling with the permission of the tribal owners so they don't need government permission and that they do not recognise their laws to even charge them. And they're going to challenge them in court because they have every right to be using their vehicle. Now, these people are actually a problem because if you think that out of those 392 that there is going to be a percentage that are going to fall in line with that mentality, you're going to have a large, larger number of unregistered and unlicensed usage. And they are a threat on the road. They are more of a danger to other people on the, on the road than they are to themselves. Because in their state of sovereignty where they've got all those rights, if they happen to hit you, they've also got the right to drive off and just leave you there. And we've actually seen these examples happen in real life. So for me, it is a really an actual real concern that the people they're bringing in will fall in line with Mark McMurtry's mentality and AB's of, you know, you don't have to follow any rules in the matrix and you don't need a license or anything because once you're tribal, you can claim all these things and you don't need to follow their rules. And the good thing about it is too that Paying taxes is optional. Local councils are illegal and don't have authority. The government doesn't have authority. None of them are valid. They're the only ones that have the valid opinions and the rights. So when they arrogantly go out of the community onto Cuyahoga Road, and if they hit an animal, a car, a person, they're well within their tribal beliefs and rights to actually, well, hey, I don't have to stop. Just because the Australian laws consider that a hit and run doesn't mean that they accept that that's actually even valid to them. And it is their mindset, the, the way that they will continue to keep doing things that are contrary to the well-being of all those around them. They have bared up the hill. But before they even put in a development application, they have bared up this entire area here and here. Just come in with a bulldozer. No development application, no consent, no approval. They just did it. Knowing it was illegal, but who cares? They're going to do what they want. And this is a continual behavior with them. I don't care, I'll do what I want. You know, there's got to be a law we can use and manipulate to get what we want. And so far, they've done a reasonable job, I suppose, of trying to use the legal system to frustrate and get what they wanted. But there is a limit to how much it can actually work for them before it comes back on them. And I'm getting off subject here because this is on a different subject that I'm leading to in that train of thought. I want to stick on to the roads because um, we've only just got these people that have this frame of mind that now drive out onto Kyogle Road. Now I know that there are some really good strips along Kyogle Road and are very clear and easy to see oncoming traffic and the road conditions are very good. But in other areas, there's full of potholes and the road narrows, there's blind corners. And depending on which part of Kyogre Road you are actually traveling on, you can expect to get a larger number of more service vehicles and trucks and more tourists. Because um, just up from where they are, is the turn off to go through Blue Knob, Lillian Rocks, 
well not really on rocks here but you see the turn off when you go down through there through to Nimbin and down through Lismore now there are actually about three turns off Kyogle Road that actually go through to Nimbin and each one of those roads is well <laughs> the main road that you come through here is actually the best all the others are more extreme and more dangerous uh, I've been down both of these I've been down all three of them and one of them when I went down I said I'm not going down that one again because there are too many blind corners there are a lot of trucks that use these roads ordinarily um, delivering to businesses throughout the larger area they could be coming from Lismore Kyogle, Mwilumba, even Byron Bay. I mean, the whole broader area, there's a lot of traffic that could be going along this road every day. And that then, it's already enough traffic that has, it's already a road that was never considered to cater with all the traffic that it's currently got. But now they propose to put all of this in and what could end up being thousands more cars. But of those cars, how many of them are actually going to be legal when they go on the road? How many of them are going to pose a risk? And the sad and true fact, and I've never seen this in any other driver and I wouldn't have ever thought it possible, but there are people in this area Oh, it's a nightmare trip that I went through this area in someone that actually doesn't know how to use the brakes in their car and because they don't know how to do it when it rains because they will skid out in their car because they don't know how to slow down for anything they don't go out in the rain and it's just the most dumbfounding thing most scariest too because you know you hang around corners it's like don't you know how to use brakes it's like no they don't it is very dumbfounding and these people actually use these roads you could be having them come to, towards you and at any time you might even have a police chase there's a car hanging around some corner that's going really radical and you think oh wow and you think I better watch out because I reckon there's a cop chasing that one and sure enough there is so the road conditions of Kyogle Road already have a lot of traffic on it and a lot of dangers if you end up with a large number of unlicensed and unregistered vehicles doing stupid things you're going to have a greater burden on also the police services ambulance services and well nothing of their insurances will pay for anything so it will be a burden on anyone that is unlucky enough if they cause an accident that you're going to be unlucky enough to be involved with that that you're going to have to bear the cost yourself and if they are not licensed and in a registered vehicle then any medical costs or injuries are not going to be covered by third-party insurances not theirs anyway luckily you will have your own but this is one of the things that you need to consider when considering all the roads all the people that intend to use it and the mindset of those people that would actually be on those private roads and then go out onto public roads. So now the other thing I'm going to look at is the bridges. Now you see Mandalay, there's three entrances to the village or the community and one up here, the only one Mandalay Road has got a sealed strip that comes from here up to about here and its condition is actually deteriorating it's actually you can see here 
That bridge isn't too bad. If I was a truck, I wouldn't mind using that bridge because, yeah, it's concrete, it looks sturdy enough. But here it is. This is going to happen at least two or three times a year where you're not going to get over that bridge. It's flooded because it is actually too high. It does need to be upgraded. But then we look further. Here's all the water rushing down. That's going down into, that's down here. That's supposed to be the bridge down there. <laughs> You're not going to get through very far, are you? But you see all that muddy water going down? That's washing out all down the sides here. Chipping out here. Where all these trucks, cement mixers, service vehicles, tourists, all of them up and down every day, all day of the year. They are tearing away at the road, especially the trucks. Now, I'm not going to uh, go too much further into what's been looked at there, but so you saw that the the bridge there, it's a nice, decent little concrete bridge. The condition of the road is pretty bad, but what you do need to do if this is an access road for the community which it is this, this is part of it up here and it should be maintained because simply of all the tourists that will use it but all these service vehicles that go up to Dolph up here anyway so they're using the road and destroying it and it is a private road that Peter Van Leishout is responsible for so he's not actually maintaining that road so there's no works actually proposed to reseal this road. There is proposed works to do 26 and a half kilometers of unsealed upgrade and to put in these sealed strips at different areas, but nothing about upgrading this sealed section that is already heavily used. And this section will continue to be used for a large part of the construction if they do not upgrade the bridges simply because well let's have a look at the condition of the bridge as you go into the village this is the picture that you can see on planet that actually looks like a nice pretty little entrance doesn't it it looks like the, it might lead off into a nice little pretty place where you could do lots of things. But then you're hit with this really scary reality. This is actually the bridge and the road through, down through here. As you can see there, there we have it. And that's the bridge. The bridge that says drive slow 20k per hour all persons using this property and its activities do so at their own risk and you should have a warning like that because if you seriously look at this bridge if you were a truck driver and you came up to this bridge I guarantee you there have been truck drivers that have actually come up to this bridge and that's why they send them all up Mandalay Road is because they said no way are we crossing that that bridge isn't going to hold what we you know it's just not going to hold us and look at it it is held together it is in the most yeah how's your father condition Now, I'm no truck driver or expert, but I'm not even sure that between those two poles on either side of the bridge that there'd actually be enough for a heavy vehicle truck to actually get through. How would it actually get between there? Uh, I mean, seriously, it it does not look like it can take the weight and that would explain why there is so much traffic up this road every day 
because of the activities that go on up and around whatever Dolph's doing up there and whatever else they may be doing and get ready, getting ready for that instead of, you know, Mark McMurtry said, no, I don't want you bringing those trucks through here all the time and going up through there. Go up Mandalay Road and go in that way and do whatever you want around here. But no, you're not coming up my road. And so they would use this road. And in the sense that these trucks too are also having to go up to a certain elevation to get up onto these ridges to actually do anything. And a large part of Mandalay Road being sealed actually provides for that. This road over here is dirt road. And it wouldn't even suffice for, well, all of this has got to be widened six metres for fire trucks to get in as well. Now, in a project or development like this, you are going to have trucks using these roads and bridges for years. These bridges even now have to be accessed to do the real works that they're applying for consent for. There are two parts to DA 21-0010. The, the first part is the concept of all of these rural land sharing communities. The other is to apply to do the real works in stage one, which is to do all the road works, construct down here in this little area here, a construction site office and storage sheds and to remove vegetation. They make it sound so blasé, don't they? To remove vegetation. To remove vegetation, to widen those 26 and a half kilometres of road requires over a hundred square kilometres of, re of vegetation removal. Now, when you think about that, that's actually, hmm, that's a lot just for the roads. And as I showed you, that is because they're only two metres wide and they have to virtually make it triple the size of what it is from two to six metres wide is triple. So that's a lot of removal to accommodate the roads that are already existing. And the unsealed roads for the high level of traffic, I don't know of many uh, situations where they've created rural developments where a high level of traffic is intended to be used on those roads where it's not a requirement to seal those roads simply on safety purposes. Because there is going to be a high level of risk. If people are going to be leaving this community any day, they, every day they will be, they need to come down and out. The roads across the top may be straight and long and you can get a speed up, but there's going to come a point where you may have blind corners or you're going downhill too fast and someone's coming uphill too fast and, you know, hogging their, your side of the road and there you have it. And in unsealed road situations, you're not going to have much of a chance, you know, if you've only got six metres wide cleared either side, you're going to end up probably hitting another a tree. So accidents are going to happen. And on those dirt roads that aren't designed to take a lot of traffic regularly for safety reasons, there is going to also be accidents that are caused because this area through here, let's put that back on. And I might point out to people that are using this, that uh, the wildlife corridor, you can actually extend yourself over into, it actually does continue over this way. I just showed at the boundary of their properties. And in fact, I should 
reduce it down here and get a closer estimation because this here estimates that what they've taken up is let's put it in yeah yeah well let's put it in square meters so it's four point well let's say four million square meters that green area is and the area that they propose to move them into is 1.4 square million meters so it's a really big reduction in the wildlife corridor and the proposed wildlife corridor and not only is it a reduction but it is also overlapping into exclusive use areas so you'd actually have to say that that 1.4 million square meters is also reduced down even further because of getting pushed away because of human habitation but if you look at it, this down here this is where they propose to put the new corridor now exclusive use lots will come down this far and it'll leave this bit open here so what they're saying is that you see this thin strip of bushes here trees that's that's the barrier that they have to get past because it's all vulnerable this side open side and domestication risks on this side i mean this wildlife proposed wildlife corridor is the worst thought out proposition I've ever seen because it does not take into consideration at all the well-being of the animals it only takes in the well-being of the development it's like no we're not using this little bit of area down here the animals can have it we'll just kick them all out of their homes so that we can build all these places through here and we can live here they can have this crappy little bit down here and this also takes away from the large area. This is all national park. This is a larger preserve area. And in the context of when you do take it out, it's like taking a big chunk out of that whole wilderness area. And this is what we've got to stop, is all this chipping away at the wilderness and leaving things the way that nature intended them to be and it we do we cannot accept the you know people say oh progress is inevitable no what is inevitable is that if you let that continue to be the attitude that we will not have one single tree left the whole bloody earth will be covered in houses and everything there's got to be a line that you mark and say, don't cross it. Now, the Tweed Shire Council have it within their bylaws to do that. And again, this is another quick thing I will actually raise right now. So this is a report that you can get from the council's website on the planning meeting that they had on the 4th of March. And it was to discuss the planning proposal to remove the permissibility of rural land sharing communities through amendment to the state environmental policy. Now there were people that actually watched that and saw that it was confirmed and voted that they are now proposing yes let's go ahead and put forward to remove permissibility under the state environmental planning policy. Now, if you go on to page two of this six page report, you will see that the recommendation is to prepare a planning proposal that will actually then remove them from the state environmental planning policy. That proposal will by necessity actually have to go up for public comment, public exhibition, before they can actually make a final ruling on that. They have to actually provide the public consultation period, much like any other development application. 
So then it would be that what the council proposes to do in removing the permissibility of rural land sharing communities in their shire, that proposal would then come up for submissions. And I dare say that people like Nightcap or Minjimbal would most definitely be putting in submissions to say that that is not acceptable and they would oppose and object that. So in circumstances like that, the things that are going on currently to answer to the submission to the objections in development application 21-0010 it would also require the community to be likewise as diligent in submissions to support the council when they put this up for public exhibition as well like any other development application that needs to be done for that public comment. So if you are truly opposed to these, well, even the council has pointed out this six page document could very well be submitted to the council as an, obje an objection to this current development. Because even um, though they describe certain things that are common amongst the 13 existing ones. A lot of the, the reasons that they're citing that it's got be, way beyond the original concept is based on this current development. They even point out that it, it is not a single lot, they are multiple lots and it is more in line with a subdivision development than it is with the concepts that it sought to accommodate, you know, back in the 70s. So I do say Council are very eager to get this um, proposal together and to put an application through and to get the public exhibition and comment done as well. So even after the public comment window closes on this particular DA, there is still more that the public can do in helping the council achieve what they want to achieve for the betterment of everybody. And I, I think that even the people that are in current rural land sharing communities, those 13 are probably on single lots and are living within the description of the basic terms of what would be allowed. But this whole development of Nightcap or Minjimbal proposes multiple um, rural, la rural land sharing communities, 10. And it wants to do that on one development application. It wants to subdivide multiple lots under the state environmental planning policy schedule that doesn't allow for anything other than a single lot and no subdivision. So there are a lot of oh, problems that they are going to have at Nightcap on Minjimbal even trying to achieve if they do actually get any kind of approval if they get stage one roads done, then what? They still have to put in a development application for the concept approval that they're asking for now for all these houses. They still have to put in a DA for that. Now, if the council have got no provision to apply that within the Tweed Shire, and they are no longer part of the state environmental planning policy. NICAP or Minjimbal cannot apply to continue the development any further. So they may get consent to do stage one. And let's face it, if Peter Van Lyshout, with resources that would appear to be far greater than those of Nightcap 
you know, NCV Enterprises, Adrian Brannock and Mark McMurtry, all these, well, busted ass broke people that have tried scheming all their lives to get it from other people and spend it as quick as they get it in. So they actually don't have a great deal of wealth. And they seem to acquire it by asking other people to pay for what they want to get control of, like all this land with NCV Enterprises. It's all in their names, not the investors' names. And any investors that have bought into this should actually remember that. You do not have a legal leg to stand on. No matter what they tell you, you've got no legal rights. So on Sunday the 14th of March at noon at the Ukai Hall, there is a community meeting to discuss all of the issues around this and to help people with, well, if you're struggling on how to put in a submission, what to say, how to say it, it's the perfect opportunity to go to the Ukai Hall and talk to others and have ideas put in your head on how you might describe it in your own words <laughs> because you know it takes a lot when you've got a complex situation and you sit down and you start to think about all of the things that bother you about it you know it can you think you've done a list it's pages long and you think you've covered everything and then you think of this and you think of that so it's always good to have other people's ideas and what they think about things to help you to find the areas that you feel the most passionate about in making your submission to the council. And this meeting is designed for people to have their, um, have their say to submit in the DA21-0010 and it is hosted by the Northern Rivers Guardians and they have gathered a fair amount of information and they also have a fair idea on how the processes are all going to work on the council and well regional panel side and all of that too so yes some wonderful people there that are actually bringing all of this information together to help people if you want to help under understanding what some of the issues are and talk with your fellow community members about what's going on and uh, yes I hope people do show up it's a lovely little spot to go to on a Sunday afternoon and uh, Let's hope it's not pouring down with rain, but even if it is, you know, it might be nice to sit near the river and watch that flood up a bit. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe you might have to sit there and watch it because has it stopped raining there yet? I tell you, it's getting a little bit chilly down here in Tassie. It's almost like, yep, summer's over. Not that we even really had one. It was like, yeah, it didn't give it a really good go at having a summer this year. <laughs> But then you'd have your people that are saying, oh, it's global warming, it's this, that and the other. It's like, you know, it's all part of cycles. They tend to move on a seven-year range and each year it just seems to modify slightly. And for sure, you know, when I was in school, I did learn about ice ages. I also learned that we are currently in the middle of an interglacial period and that one day there will be a glacial period again. Nobody knows when, but scientists also say that even though we don't know when, we also know that we are overdue for a glacial period. So it would be no surprise if we did get a little ice age and things got a little cold because even before global warming it was predict predicted. <laughs> so anyway. So if anyone does actually want a copy of this KMZ file that you can actually uh, use and have a look at yourself on Google Earth, you can just send me a message and I'll send you a link. I'm not going to give out links 
publicly anywhere, but I will give them out to people if they request them. Now I'm pretty sure that I have covered all the traffic concerns that I've had, but one of the things that maybe I haven't actually mentioned, I have in others, is that this busy road here with the wildlife corridor and what would actually happen in the case that all right so you've hit an animal and it's on the side of the road suffering what do you do and uh, my daughter came in yesterday she was upset because there was this blue tongue lizard in the middle of the road this truck had actually swerved and stopped to avoid it and she had too and this idiot in a ute just comes hooning along and runs it straight over and they they just drive off my daughter got out and she actually took it down to a vet's and being a blue tongue lizard they all accept them but what would happen in the instance of an animal being injured on any of these roads i mean would they be like the idiot in the ute and just keep driving and leave the animal there or would they actually do something to help the animal so the well-being of animals if they are involved in an accident on all these 26 half and 26 and a half kilometer roads you know, is not only just that they had been displaced in their habitat but they're roadkill as well and will they even be considered for that? Will there be signs up to warn of wildlife? And what level of activity is going to go on along these dirt roads of a night time when it's even more dangerous for car accidents, especially with animals? But then you've got, there are 50 kilometers of road. Well, they say around 50 kilometers. And all these kilometres, and these are only other ones that are marked, there are a couple others that go through there as well. Now, these roads can be used as well because the idea of buying into Nightcap or Minjimbo is that you pay your, your lot to get in and you jointly own all of this. So jointly owning all of this means you can drive down this road because you jointly own it. You can drive anywhere on all of these things because you jointly own it. The only places you can't go are the exclusive use areas. And one would assume they'd say, well, you can't go down to that little strip that nobody does want to go down to because, you know, that's on the other side of the hill and sloping out towards more the Cuyahoga Road and the open exposure. So, yeah, people don't want that. They want the bush and to be feeling nice and cosy and secluded. Yeah, much like what the animals used to feel like before they moved them out. That's what they want for themselves. And I don't think that's very much in line with the do no harm philosophy that they keep sprouting. And every time I think of do no harm, I would just like to take those words and make them eat them. I mean, seriously. Does anyone actually even buy that? But then again, Mark McMurtry has been commenting about me lately. <laughs> ah. Anyway, I'm not going to get into that. Maybe another video. It's worth a laugh anyway. <laughs> and on that note, I'm going to finish up here because, yes, I do think I have exhausted all the concerns and well maybe that it might give you an idea of the things that bother you most uh, what you might even actually see as realistically happening and i do realistically see a lot of unregistered and unlicensed cars i mean un yes unlicensed drivers and unregistered cars uh, on the road because they're coming out of the community, they're going down to the road, they're going to pick their kids up from school, they're going into Mwilumba. They don't need licenses or registration because they're tribal people and they've got permission of the traditional owners to drive on their lands. 
and they will do what Mark McMurtry does. They'll show them how to do it, you know, how to buck the system. <laughs> and on that note, I'm going to say safe travelling on the roads and let's hope that there's not thousands more on the roads. They're just on roads alone. You've got to stop them from being there. Bye, I'll catch you next time. <laughs>